Good morning, Berean. How is everyone? I blessed my soul this morning. Anyone else? Anyone else there? Let's just pack it up. We just, you know. <laughs> so we are still in the book of Nehemiah. So if you would turn with me to chapter 7, we're going to be there. Actually, before that, we have some work, some pre-work to do. Let me go ahead, let me pray, and then we will recap. And then I have to give some disclaimer and some background info. So let me go ahead, let's pray, and then we'll get into our text and the rest in our scripture this morning. Lord Jesus, you're gracious, glorious, kind, and wonderful. Lord, everything we do, I pray, would bring you honor and glory. Lord, I pray that we would turn our eyes on you, that everything we think, everything we do, everything, everything of our lives would sing all glory be to Christ. Lord, I pray that we would bring you glory as we seek to rebuild the city of God and we're in our study this morning of the scriptures. Lord, I pray that you would be with me as I preach. Hide me behind the cross. Oh, illuminate our eyes, Holy Spirit, to your word. It's in your good name. Amen. So first, as usual, it's the previously on X-Men thing, we will recap where we've been in Nehemiah. So God calls this man, Nehemiah, to go to this great city of Jerusalem that had been destroyed. And he calls Nehemiah to go rebuild the wall. Then through providence, through many dangers, toils, and snares, he, through men that would seek to destroy the work of God, men that would seek to harm Nehemiah's life and the people of God, God brings him through. God provides resources, people that are able to work and build and protect, protect the work of God. As we remember in our previous study, that in one hand they had a sword, one hand they had a trowel, they worked hard, they builded and defended. And then last week we talked about the wall being finished. And you see they're open for business. They opened the wall. The city of God was um, open for business. The worship of God continued. Now, in our text this morning, I have to set up for you and give you a brief disclaimer. Brief disclaimer. We're in a text that's much like the beginning chapter of Matthew. I did this when we went through other genealogies. So in our text this morning, Nehemiah is giving the genealogy of all the people that have come back to the city of God. All of them. People, you'll see people, and we'll go through this. But I have to give you, uh, I have to give you some background information to make this to make this actually more meaningful so we understand what's going on more clearly. I am a huge, by the way, I am a huge nerd. I am a huge geek. I'm one of those people. I mean, if you haven't already been able to tell, I love things like sci-fi, things like that. So this is much like the prequels to Star Wars. Like you guys remember the Star Wars movie and you've seen like the new ones that came out and you've seen the blue lightsaber and you're like, yeah, that was Anakin's, that was Luke's. It all makes sense. Or like the Marvel movies. You guys seen that in the, uh, I think, Iron Man 3 when they seen uh, Thor's hammer that came down. You guys seen that? If you knew what was going on, it made more sense. If you didn't know what was going on, you seen on screen like, huh, there's a hammer. I don't know what that means. That's the thing. So what happens here, I have to give you a little bit of background info. Like, for example, when we were watching that movie, me and my wife, She's like, what's up with the hammer? I'm like, that's Thor's hammer. We had a completely different reaction to something that went on screen because I knew what was going on with the background info. She didn't. I'm filling in some background info so when we get to this text, it's not boring and we're like watching paint dry. So let's go ahead and give a little bit of uh, examples here of where we're going. So there's a historical timeline of Israel. So Nehemiah, the story of Nehemiah doesn't just happen in a vacuum. It's not just, oh, okay. There's things that happened before. There's things that happen after. So all of like redemptive history, God calls a man named Abraham. So in the beginning, God creates our first parents, Adam and Eve. We have Noah, the world gets destroyed. And then we get to this man named Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they become a large family. The people of Israel grow in captivity in Egypt. They become slaves. God delivers them through a man named Moses. And God, pardon me, gives them the law, the law of God. 
And what that does is they become a people for God's own glory. They're set apart. And God warns them in his law what will happen if they are disobedient. The law, give it a brief thing here, they're saved by grace alone, by faith alone, but they demonstrate the glory of God. They're saved the same way we are, by the way. It's I want to make that painfully clear, and I also want to say this too, that God gives blessings and cursings in the law. If you obey me, good things happen. If you disobey me, bad things happen. And what's going on here in the book of Nehemiah, bad things have happened. Bad things have happened. (laughs) And good things are about to happen here because they've turned their hearts to obedience to Christ, obedience to God. So look with me, uh, So with judgment, so God sends judgment on the people of Israel. This is, so the thing about God's judgment, I want to say this too, when God brings about judgment, I know there's a lot of talk about that these days, where people, we feel like society is, there's massive tensions and stuff like that going on. God is very slow to anger. God is wrathful. Don't get, don't get me wrong. God is wrathful and God is just and God is holy. But God is also very slow to bring about judgment because God is gracious and wants people to repent. Now, this is what happens with Israel. God sends prophets to Israel. So God gives Israel the law and says, you must obey, right? You must obey because you are my people. God also sends, when Israel disobeys, God sends prophets to Israel, almost like one of my seminary professors put it like this, they're covenant enforcers. So what happens is, is God gives the law to Israel, Israel disobeys, God sends a prophet to remind them. Much like, much like when I forget to take out the garbage, I am reminded by a seven-year-old that's become, go tell, my wife looks at my seven-year-old, or my six-year-old, says, hey, go tell your daddy to take out the garbage. She has a message, she comes to me, I take out the garbage, she reminds me of what's going on. They're great. Kids are great like that. So point is, point is, prophets in the Old Testament, God sends a ton of prophets to Israel. Men like Isaiah, men like Jeremiah, that say, repent, turn away, don't do this wickedness because part of the covenant, there are consequences. There are consequences for disobedience. There are consequences. And the thing, with the, the thing where we, I think we get tripped up with, with prophets is everyone's looking, okay, what are they trying? They're like future tellers. There's two roles of a prophet. There is foretelling what will happen if you disobey the covenant, much, much like pastors, what will, what will happen. If you, if you don't trust Christ, bad things are going to happen. You will face the judgment of God. It's not that we want that to happen, but we want everyone everywhere to repent. But that's the thing. You remind people what's going on. They're foretelling what will happen. And then they foretell. Prophets foretell things. They say, this is the covenant. This is the word of God. This is the covenant. This is the word of God. They foretell what people already know to be true. Not that they're telling you anything in new information. Repent, like when Jesus, or when uh, Isaiah or Jeremiah is saying, repent, repent, for something bad's going to happen, repent. You guys know this. You have the law. They're just telling you something you already know. So look with me. So in the historical timeline of Israel, God God gives them the law. God sends prophets to them. Very slow. We're talking hundreds of years here. Slow to bring about judgment. And then Israel doesn't obey God. So God brings judgment. Look with me, if you will, in the book of Jeremiah. We're in 53. I know, I tried to make it as big as humanly possible. I know, the eye test. We're still, we're still working on those little eyeglass things they have at the opera. So when I, when I failed on PowerPoint to make it ginormous, that uh, we can still look. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> I'm working on that too. Uh, so here's God's judgment on the people of Israel. This is tremendously important for our text in Nehemiah. And the captain. This is the fall of Jerusalem. Actually, you can actually see in your Bible that the temple had already been burned at this time. The siege of Jerusalem had already happened or is already coming about and God's people are in perilous times to fall in the hands of the Lord. We'll start in verse 24. And the captain of the guard took Sadok, 
the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the threshold. And from the city he took officers who had been in command of the men of war and seven men of the king's council who were found in the city and the secretary of the commander of the army who mustered the people of the land, 60 men of the people of the land who were found in the midst of the city. And Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon in Rebelah. And the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death at Rebelah in the hand of Hamath. So Judah was taken into exile out of the land. This is the number of the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive in the seventh year, 3,023 Judeans. In the 18 years of Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away captive from Jerusalem 832 persons, 30 in the first, in the 23rd year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried away all the captives of the Judeans, 745 persons. All the persons were 4,600. Brothers and sisters, what we're seeing here is the absolute judgment of God. God comes in and takes the people captive and brings them to Jerusalem and brings about his wrath for, for disobedience. But I want to say this about the the wrath and disobedience of God. God always offers repentance. Repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. Look with me. I know this is another large passage of scripture. These people in, in Jeremiah are experiencing the curses previously laid out in the law, in the book of Deuteronomy. Look with me, if you will, in Deuteronomy chapter 30 about what happens when people dis- what happens when the people of God disobey the word of God? And all these things, and when all these, this was written, just preface here, this was written a long time before the city of Jerusalem gets destroyed. A long time before the situ- city of Jerusalem gets destroyed. Look with me in verse 30, or in chapter 30, verse 1. And all, when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to your mind, all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice, and all that I have commanded you today, with all of your heart and with all of your soul, then the Lord your God will restore, will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. He will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcast, outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from, from there the Lord your God will gather you. And from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you to the land of your fathers, that your fathers possess, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and that you may live. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecute you. And all shall obey the voice of the Lord your God and keep his commandments that I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hands, in the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your cattle, and the fruit of your ground. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you. And he took del- as he took delight in your fathers, then you will obey the Lord your God to keep his commands and his statutes statutes that are written in the book of the law when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul. Brothers and sisters, in the book of Nehemiah, this is being fulfilled. God is faithfully bringing his people back to the land. This is why this book is so awesome, because God destroyed the city of Jerusalem through Babylon, through them coming in. They were basically just a tool in his hand to discipline his people. And then God brings his people back to the land. This is the point. This is exactly what we're witnessing in this text. God is fulfilling his promise to restore the people of Israel when they repent. Here's a slight application for you. You are never so far gone that God cannot restore you if you repent. This is the whole crux of our text. The repentance and faith in God brings about salvation. 
The Old Testament saints, they repented. We have a way in which we repent too. It's coming to faith in Jesus Christ who lived the perfect life, died a brutal death in your place for your sins if you will turn away from your sins and trust in Christ. If you will repent. Repent. Now, I keep using this word, repent. What is repentance? What is repentance? It is turning away. It's a fun, it's really weird. We say the word repentance. It's kind of a funny sounding word. You ever think it's funny? I think it's funny. It's funny. No one uses the word repent. I use the word repent with my kids all the time. They're like running around. One's trying to hit each other with like a wiffle bat, you know, trying to swim in the toilet. Repent! Don't do that. Turn away. Repentance is turning away from something and turning towards something else. Literally like making a U-turn. You guys ever seen that? Make a U-turn? Maybe you've hung an illegal U-turn or two occasionally. <laughs> we, were, we were in Kentucky when... Uh, so when I was a kid, my dad, apparently in Kentucky, at least the parts we went to, there's a U-turn lane. They might have not been a real U-turn lane, but people were using it like one, like the left-hand turn lane. They hang a U-E. My dad freaked out one time the first time he seen this. They're like, whoa, 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 dude. That's like the fourth one we've seen. That's what you're doing. You're turning away from, in repentance, you're turning away from your sin. You're going one direction and then you're going the other. So to make this with Jesus, you're turning towards your sin, walking towards your sin, running off a cliff and about ready to die and fall in the hands of the living God. And you're turning away and you're turning toward the cross. Hallelujah. Covered by the blood of Jesus Hallelujah. in faith in righteousness. Hallelujah. That is repentance, brothers and sisters. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I don't know every one of you, like personally, if you're here today without Christ, make today be the day of repentance. Let today be the day of repentance. Every one of us is a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's the, th here's the difference between Christians and non-Christians. It's just beggars telling where other beggars where the food is. We're all completely jacked up apart from Christ. Everyone in this room that's, that's, that knows Christ, loves Christ, would say, dude, we're not better than you. We're not better than you. Jesus covered my sin and he can cover yours. And here's the thing about sin, friends. There is judgment for sin. There is judgment for sin. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. You're running headlong after your own death. You're doing that which will kill you spiritually and separate you from God for eternity. And you'll experience him in the fullness of his wrath if you don't repent and turn away. That same verse, Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you trust in Christ today, you will be saved. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? Amen. Now, I know some of you might be sitting there thinking, Pastor John, you don't know what I've done. You don't know my life. You don't, God, maybe, maybe you've done something horrible. Maybe you've done something awful. Maybe you're like, think God wouldn't love you or anything like that. I assure you, I assure you, friend, if you come to Jesus in faith, you will find him to be a perfect savior. He will save you. He saved in the book of Nehemiah, we see that the, the city had been destroyed for 140 years. 140 years. That's over a generation. People's great-grandparents were there seeing the thing destroyed with fire. If he, can, if he can rebuild a city, he can rebuild your life. God saved a murderer in the New Testament named Paul. That guy's name was Saul. He had such a radical conversion that he went from being the, being the man named Saul who persecuted Christians and was there at the first stoning of Stephen and held their coats. If he can save him and turn him into one of the greatest missionaries ever, to one of the greatest missionaries in all of Scripture, he can do something great with your life. I assure you. And I'll say this too. I'll say this too. Jesus gives a parable of the sower in Matthew 13. We're not going to turn there. But Matthew 13, 1 to 8 gives this parable. And I know some of you might, some, of you, some people might be thinking, well, I don't know what God can do with what's left over of my life. 
I know this was a, this, a friend of mine in college. This is, what, this is what he thought. He thought that his life was completely over. He had already messed his life up so bad, it's beyond, re, it's beyond repair. And I assure you, it's not. In the parable of the sower, the, there's a multiplying number that when the, good, when, the, when the gospel comes and good seed falls upon the soil, it produces some 100-fold, some 60-fold, and some 30-fold. Imagine if God multiplied the impact of your life in Christ a hundred times. Our God can do that, brothers and sisters, when we're awakened to the truth of the gospel, when we repent and we trust in Christ. Christian, this also is very good for you as well. How many of you have ever found it very difficult to witness to somebody? Let's be honest. Come on. I find it difficult. I'm a pastor. (laughs) I'm very serious. It's very difficult. There is no one so far gone that God cannot save them. It doesn't matter if they're, it, it doesn't matter what their lifestyle is. It doesn't matter what they're into. They could be a drug addict. They could be anything, anything. God can save them. God can break through and save them with the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is salvation. Amen? Amen. So, witness. We share the gospel with everyone in hopes that some will repent. Amen? There's no one so far gone. Well, we shouldn't have the mindset that somebody, well, they've destroyed their life, got too far gone for God. No, I want to give them the gospel because God can do something amazing with their life. Amen? Let's not withhold that message. Let's let God, let's, let's witness to everyone from the grocery store to uh, to school, to work, to people you meet on the street. Let's tell them about Jesus. Amen? Amen. This is glorious because God, like like I said with the Apostle Paul, he was a murderer. You would think he was the least likely dude in the world to come to Jesus, right? He's killing Christians, you know. That's why when Ananias in the book of Acts comes to him, that's why he's kind of freaked out saying, huh, there's... Uh, br- brother Saul, like you read the text in Acts, he's kind of freaked out. He's like, hey, that's the guy that was killing Christians. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm a little weird. It's a little strange to come hang out with him, but he went and gave him the gospel. And he was saved. Jesus converted Paul in the road of Damascus. But now that I give this text that God has brought judgment to the people of Israel, and he's offered the people of Israel repentance if they turn away from him. This makes more sense now that we're in Nehemiah 7. So look with me, if you will, back to the book of Nehemiah. We're going to look for 7, 5 to 7, and I want to give some context here as to what's going on. Now when the wall had been built, and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers, let me go down to verse 5. Then my God put in my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. And I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up at first. And I had found written in it. These were the people of the providence who came up from the captivity, those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judea, each to his town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jehu, Nehemiah, Ezra, Ramah, Nahaminah, Mordecai, Bilashen, Mizarephath, Bigel, Nahum, and Bahan. So here's what happened. We've seen in Jeremiah that these people were taken away. These people are, there's people coming back. So just to give you a brief little piece of history here. These are people that are, there were multiple exile, waves of exiles that came back to the city of Jerusalem. Multiple. We see in the book of Ezra that a man named Zerubbabel and Ezra brought back people with them. These are more than likely the people that they're talking about. These are the genealogies that are going on here. And this is not just the city of Jerusalem. This is to their own towns. They're repopulating. The people of God are returning home. They're coming back. They're fulfilling what we just seen in Deuteronomy, where they've turned away. They're coming back into the land. They're repenting and turning back toward the Lord their God. This is, you're seeing prophecy fulfilled right here in this text. Now, what's going on 
let's look at these genealogies as they're coming through. These genealogies can be broken down into three separate things. The people of Israel, the worshiping class, and then those who could not prove their genealogy. Let's look at all three, and because they're all broken down kind of nicely, and I'm just going to give you a preface. I'm probably going to, bu- my Hebrew is slightly rusty, so I'm going to butcher the names like with a dull hatchet, and we're all going to, it's going to be great. So we're all going to get through this. I was going to have Brother Dave read this for me, but <laughs> he just gives me a thumbs up, like, yeah, I was doing it. Like, because you know what? I figure the public reading of Scripture, even if it's genealogies and names, blesses the people of God. Amen? Paul tells Timothy to give himself the exhortion in public reading of Scripture. This is what's glorious, brothers and sisters. So let's look in verse uh, 7b. The number of the people of Israel, the sons of Parash, 2,172. The sons of Shippeth, 372. Sons of Ara. 652, the sons of uh, Pathmoab, namely the sons of Jehu and Joab, 2018, the sons of Elam, 1,254, the sons of Zetu, 845, the sons of Zedekiah, 760, the sons of Minam, 648, the sons of Bebop, or Behi, 628, the sons of Asgad, 2,322, the sons of Amimiabchai, 667, the sons of Binja, 2,067, the sons of Adon, 655, the sons of Alter, namely of Hezekiah, 98, the sons of Hisham, 328, the sons of Bezai, 324, the sons of Hadapoth, 120, 112, the sons of Gibeon, 95, the men of Bethlehem and uh, Nepeth, 188, the men of Azoth, 128, the men of uh, Bezameth, 42, the men of Kirath, Shifrasap, Shifrasai, and Bizrath, 743, the men of Rama and Gibeb, 621, the men of Mi- uh, Micamas, 120, 122, the men of Bethel and Ai, 123, the men of other Nebo, 52, the men of other Elam, 100, or 1,054, the sons of Haram, 320, the sons of Jericho, 345, the sons of Hidad and Ono, 721, the sons of Shipheth, 3,930, Brothers and sisters, I know this must, this, this kind of sounds when you read something like this, like a graduation list. You guys ever do that? You go to graduation and they butcher the names like Pastor John does these Hebrews. It's like that. It's literally like reading the phone book. What I was, I seen when people were um, sad about missing graduations last year. I heard someone joking about it. He's, and it's sad that people would not be able to celebrate those things. Uh, one of the, one of my friends was joking around. He's like, you know what? It's kind of weird. He's like, if I missed graduation, be like, I could just dress up in a shower cap and a, and a gown and read the phone book. <laughs> I was like, seriously, it's not funny. But it's kind of like that, right? You see all of these names and all of these numbers. You want to see something very interesting about this? God is preserving his people and blessing them even when they're in captivity. We'll see this later on in the other text next week when we see all the totals here. But did you guys catch that in, Jer- in, in, uh, in uh, Jeremiah? How many people were taken away? Did you guys catch that? Let me fully get the number. It was 4,600. Trust me, the people here are, labor, are more than 4,600. God blesses his people even when they're under his judgment. God sustained and providentially, it wasn't because they were awesome, it was because he is awesome. 
when God gives grace and mercy, it is never because we're awesome. It is always because he is awesome. God is providing worshipers. These are the, the, these, this group of people is the common everyday folks that were in the city, in the nation of Judah, that were worshipers of the Lord God. God is giving himself worshipers. Amen? You guys notice that? He's giving himself worshipers. Look with me in the worship class or the worship leaders of the people of Israel. This is amazing. So let's continue. The priests in verse 39. The priests of Jedidiah, namely of the house of Jehu, 973. The sons of Emer, 1,052. The sons of Pechaz, 1,247. The sons of Haram, 1,017. The Levites, the sons of Jehu, namely of Kidmel, the sons of Hores, 74. The singers of the sons of Asaph, 148. The gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Erechtach, the sons of Talamon, the sons of uh, Kobup, the sons of Hetat, the sons of Shebo, 138. The temple servants of Jehaz, the sons of Heshpop, the sons of Tedbeop, the sons of Kirsh, the sons of Sai, the sons of Paran, the sons of Laban, the sons of uh, Hegbop, the sons of Shimai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Gideon, the sons of Gezer, the sons of Rebop, the, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nic- Nicodiai, the sons of Gazan, the sons of Uza, the sons of Pez, the sons of Messi, the sons of Meliam, the sons of um, Nekapushkin, the sons of uh, Bakbuk, the sons of uh, Hakaifa, the sons of Harhar, the sons of Bazlet, the sons of Mehad, the sons of Harshka, the sons of Birkin, and it goes on and it lists even Solomon's servants. Uh, what's funny is I actually practiced this week, this week in my office, and I'm like, I'm going to butcher this. I had Max McLean reading the Bible with me, and I'm going through. I'm like, come on, Max, help me. Help me, Max. And it was, I'm going through these names. Look with me in verse 57. The sons of Solomon's servants who were part of the temple. The sons of Sotai, the sons of Sophirthia, the sons of Peredad, the sons of Jaal, the sons of Darkan, the sons of uh, Gidel, the sons of Shepheth, the sons of Hattil, the sons of... Um, We'll go with that. The sons of Ammon, all the temple servants of Solomon's servants were 392. Something very interesting is going on here, brothers and sisters. Even though this is a very boring text of scripture, and it sounds like we're reading the phone book. Something very interesting is going on here because all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable. Hallelujah. All scripture, even this stuff. Hallelujah. I want to throw this out here. Do you guys see the breakdown of what's being said here? The priests in verse 39. Do you guys know who the priests of Israel were? The priests of Israel were the people that would present the sacrifice. The sons of Aaron, integral part of worship in the Old Testament. Integral. You couldn't bring a, a, a sacrifice or an offering without first bringing it to the priests to do that. Like this or the, the, the temples, the Levites. These are the people that would ta- teach the word of God to the people of God. The scribes and the Levites. We see Ezra in, he'll read the law here in a week or two. The temple servants. These are the people that, that, that cut wood for the temple and bring worship to the Lord. Solomon's servants. They're mentioned with the temple servants and probably served within the temple. God is supernaturally preserving his worship for his people. He is supernaturally preserving his people to worship him and supernaturally uh, preserving worship, the, the means of worship in the Old Testament so that his people can worship him. I'll say this too. In the Old Testament, worship was very, very serious. Very serious. People died when they didn't worship correctly. In the old, uh, Nadab and Abihu offered false fire before the Lord and were consumed with fire and it killed them. 
a man named Uzzah. You guys ever read that in 2 Samuel? They were getting the ark, and he's, st- he's steadying the ark. And he th- the ark falls, and he reaches out to grab it. And he, it says the anger of the Lord was kindled against him and got dropped dead. I've always looked at that story and been like, wow, that seems kind of mean, doesn't it? I mean, he was just trying to, the ark was falling. I probably would have grabbed it too. Like, it seems like that. But God gave a very, very, very strict prescription in the Old Testament how he was to be worshipped. The ark was supposed to be carried a certain way by Levites and priests. What you're seeing here is God's supernatural grace to the people of God so that they might know him and love him and the worship of God might continue in the Old Testament even though that the people of God sinned. This is grace upon grace upon grace to the people of God. God sustains his worship. God sustains his people so that they might know him and he's continued this faithfulness even when his people were un faithful. Amen? When we are unfaithful, he is still faithful. Not in the same way, but I am reminded that of God's sustaining ability to worship, even in the work of our church. Amen? Before I got here, it was what, four years without a pastor? Without some, I mean, there was pastors here. There were elders and leaders and things like that, but not a Uh, not a senior pastor. And God sustained our church. God has sustained our church so that we might worship him and be missionaries to our community and see people repent and believe the gospel. God has sustained us. And we can look at this, and it looks like we're reading the phone book, but brothers and sisters, this is a heritage of faith. This is a heritage of God protecting his people, making it so that his people can worship him. Exactly, in some sense, what he's done with our church. He's preserved us since 1963. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. And he'll bring us through much, 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 much more. Because he is faithful. He is faithful faithful brothers and sisters. I want that to be front and center so that when we see something like this and we see God do great things by sustaining his people, we can say all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ. Now there is a third group here. So we have the, we have the, the regular people of God. We have the worship, the, the worshipers of God, the temple servants, the priests, the Levites, all of these things that God supernaturally preserves. And then we have those who could not prove their genealogy. Those who could not prove their genealogy. Look with me in verse 61. We'll go through this and be like reading the phone book again. (laughs) The following were those who came up from Telamon, Teleharsh, Cherim, Adon, Emer, but could not prove their fathers prove their fathers houses nor their descent whether they belong to Israel the sons of Diliad the sons of Toba Tobiah the sons of Nicodai 642 also the priests the sons of Horibath the sons of Hekaz the sons of uh, Barzillai who had taken a wife of the daughters of Barzillai the Gideonite and was called by their name they sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but was not found there. So they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until a priest with Unum and Thurum could, be, could arise. Now, I want to say this very, this is very interesting because here's, here's the thing. When we look at this culturally, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us, right? We read this like, oh, you can't prove your genealogy. It's like 23 and me. Like, what are we doing here? I mean, people are really getting into their genealogies nowadays, right? You can get like a cool, you can get like a, like a skin sample or whatever. I mean, I haven't done that. So clearly I'm trying to describe something I haven't done. You send out a little blood sample. They tell you the, like all the people that are in your family and trace you all the way back. So you can see like your spectrum of your genealogy. So genealogy in the Old Testament, just to give you some context here, genealogy in the Old Testament was very, very important. Very important. Like Gentiles could not come to certain portions of the temple because they they were Gentiles. They were ceremonially unclean. 
Although they could worship God, they could only go so far. Priests in the Old Testament must be descendants of Aaron, right? To be, there was Levites and all these people that we see here. This was very, very, very important in the Old Testament. Not so much anymore. We'll get to that in a moment. But I'm throwing this out here. This is the reason why Nehemiah was looking for the book of genealogies in the first place. And so, so Nehemiah was ultimately, this is for worship of God in the Old Testament to do that which he had prescribed to do, right? Amen? You guys see what's going on? So the other thing that's really some context here is that they have this thing of the unum and the thurum. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us because we don't know exactly what's going on. In verse 65, the governor told them they were not to partake of the most holy food until the priest with Unum and Thurum could arise. Now, there's a reason they want that they're trying to wait. The Unum and Thurum was a way to determine God's will in Exodus 20:30. The goal was to document who was in Israel and who wasn't. So the, in the priestly garment that you see right there, there's this like breastplate, unum, thurum. This was a way to determine God's will. This was much a, much like, ca- like when, Jesus, when Jesus died, they cast lots for, uh, in the old, or when uh, Matthias, when the apostles were trying to figure out who should replace Judas, they cast lots. What they were trying to do is they were trying to figure out what God's will was for them. By using, this, by using this means. In the Old Testament, they had the unum and the thurum, and that, would, that was a way for them to prove, okay, that determines God's will. Like, if we, can't docu- if we can't document with black and white, paper and pencil, who's in the kingdom of God, well, maybe the unum and the thurum can tell us, and these people are actually being careful. They're being very careful. It sounds like, for us, it sounds like a mean thing to do, to say, hey, you can't, you can't be part of this job description. But like I said a few moments ago, in the Old Testament, people were killed, like people died for false worship. They were trying to seek to be biblical. Like in Nehemiah a couple weeks ago, when the, the Nehemiah knew that the prophet had told, when the prophet had told Nehemiah, hey, let's go meet in the house of the Lord and shut the door, he knew that man was lying because he had told him to do something contrary to the law of God. Amen because he understood the worship code of Israel. Like, this is exactly what's, this is exactly why they're doing. This is not because they're trying to be mean. They're not trying to, they're not trying to be petty. They're trying to be biblical. Amen. Let me give you some application here from this, from this thing, from the people who couldn't prove their genealogy. The, the, the leaders of Israel were actually trying to be biblical. They were seeking to be biblical. They were seeking to take the word of God and apply it to all situations in their lives, in all situations in the church. This is why, uh, like I said, worship in the Old Testament was very, very serious with genealogies. You had to prove, like if you were going to be a priest, you walked in, and the priest of the Old Testament, like just, just to give you another little thing here, the priest, when they would go, the priest would only go in the Holy of Holies one day a year on the Yom Kippur. They tie a rope around the dude's leg in case he got in there and died so they could pull him out. This was serious. These people are seeking to be biblical to take the word of God and prescribe it to the situations of God. And this is exactly, I don't think we think about this enough in our society. We need to be people of the book. This is one of the reasons why we're Berean Bible Church. We're Bereans. We search the scriptures. We love the scriptures. We want to seek to be biblical in all aspects of our lives. This is exactly what these people were doing. It's a, it's a roundabout way of looking at it, but that's what they were doing. They were seeking to be biblical and get the Bible's answers for their lives, for the restarting of worship. That's exactly what we're doing here. This is the reason why, um, like if you think about it, this is why we have biblical church leadership. I just wrote a few of these down this week while I was thinking about this and, and being biblical. We have biblical church leadership. We have elders that are called and competent and qualified according to biblical standards of 1 Timothy and Titus. That's amazing. A lot of churches don't do that. 
It's a blessing to be in a biblical church. We preach through books of the Bible. We don't avoid texts like this. Do you have any idea how much it's tempting to avoid something like this where it sounds like you're reading the phone book? <laughs> and where you're like, huh, wow. And you butcher Hebrew names with a dull hatchet. You know, like you butcher that and you're trying to read. And not, and, but that's the thing. We don't avoid hard texts. We don't avoid things in the scriptures. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And all scripture is God-breathed and profitable, even this. Even this. Even stuff that, we, even stuff that we're like, I don't know, but we can see God's handiwork in it. We can see God sustaining his people. And it makes it more interesting when we have more context. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's why we preach through books of the Bible. That's why we pick theological songs that are blessings to the people of God. So that we might take the, we might remind the people of God of the character of God. So that when we sing, all glory be to Christ our King. Hallelujah. And you go through a hard time and you don't remember things that I say up here. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. No one remembers what things pastors say. Very few people do. <laughs> you remember songs and hymns and things like that so that when you're in your worst portion, when you're in, utter agony utter agony you'll sing it as well with my soul you will sing all glory be to Christ you will sing uh, you'll sing things that have, have sparked your soul that's why we pick those things that's why we entrust that to our worship ministry so that we might pick th songs that are theological we do church discipline if necessary that's another thing we do um if you're a member of our church and you're running off in rampant sin, we will discipline you, not because we don't love you, but because we do. Amen. We do that. Um, we make the gospel front and center of our ministry. Amen. We make the gospel of Christ crucified, that Jesus lived the life you could not lead, died the death you deserve to die in your place and for your sins. That is the hallmark in front of our ministry. Hallelujah. This is what we do. And we're unapologetic about that. Christ above all. Jesus over everything. That's what we do. We don't sugarcoat the gospel. We call people to repentance. We tell people there is a real heaven. There is a real hell. There is a real Savior. And if you don't get right with him, you will, find, you will wind up in hell under the judgment of God. Not because we don't love you, but because we do. But because so, like someone's sitting around getting a cancer diagnosis. I heard Paul Washer give this example one time. His mom had, he had, he had went in for his mom and she had got a cancer diagnosis. And he put the, the, he put the x-ray up and showed him the tumors. Like, Mrs. Washer, this is, this is the tumor. He looked over, he goes, that guy ruined my mom's day. Made her cry. He did that because he was trying to save her life. We really, believe the, we really believe the truths that are in this book and we'll die for them. We'll be in prison for them. We'll do whatever it takes to herald them from the rooftops to wherever and we'll preach the gospel as loud as humanly possible. That's, that's why we seek to be biblical. We don't sugarcoat anything. The other thing too that that we can point to within this text that is absolutely wonderful. I know I said this a few moments ago, that genealogy in the Old Testament was massively important for them. Genealogy doesn't mean anything now. That's what's great about the gospel. It's not about your birth, but about your rebirth. Hallelujah. Say that again. It's not about your birth, it's about your rebirth. In Galatians 3, 28 and 29, it says this, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. For if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise, heirs of Abraham. All the promises of Abraham are for the church. The Jew or Greek, like I said before, the Greeks could only go so, non-Jews could only go so far. That veil got torn when Jesus died. We get to come to Jesus. The, no ethnicity, anything like that, social status. Like I said, it's not about your birth, but about your rebirth. And this is wonderful news. Wonderful news. I'm not from a great, I'm not from a great lineage, tell you the truth. I had a bunch of people that were like 
coal miners and blue collar Joes, and we, we're not like we're not blue blood by any stretch of the imagination. Like if you come during the week here and you see me and I'm in my office, I've usually got cut off shorts on a John Deere hat. I am clearly like a blue collar, <laughs> like like I I fix my own car. I mean, I'm just, I'm, that's just what I do. It's not about it's not about your status, but about Christ. It's not about your social status or anything along those lines, but about Jesus. It doesn't matter about our our lineage, our relatives. It's not about our relatives or what your... And that does say this too. Your grandparents might love Jesus. Your parents might love Jesus. Your brother might love Jesus. Your sister might love Jesus. But unless you love Jesus, you're under the wrath of God. Unless you repent and believe... You can't get to heaven on anyone else's coattails. You cannot get to heaven on anyone else's coattails. You must be saved by the blood of Christ applied to you in your place and for your sins. Like I said, it's not about your birth. It's about your rebirth. That's what we must know and we must love. It's not about our ethnic background. All people, all places. Uh, there'd be nations, tribes, tr- nations, tongues, and tribes all around the, 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 f- the glory of God, around the, the throne one day. I have brothers and sisters that don't speak my language. I have brothers and sisters. I met one time on a mission trip to Mexico. There's a little kid that speaks Spanish. I speak English. We're from different, different ages. Everything was completely different. He's like, Jesus is my Savior. He said in Spanish. But he's like, Jesus is my Savior. I'm like, Jesus is my Savior. And he looked at me and goes, mi hermano, my brother. We hugged. He's like five. I was in college. It was awesome. It was glorious. That's, that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to live the life we could not lead, died the death we deserve to die, and call everyone everywhere to repentance and faith in him. That is the message of the gospel. That is what we see in Nehemiah. God calling his people, them repenting, them trusting in Christ or them trusting in God and God restoring them. Let God do that for us. And if you're here today without Christ, if you're here today without Christ, let today be the day of salvation. Amen? Embrace Christ. Let me go ahead. Let me pray. And we can conclude. Lord Jesus, I thank you for who you are, for what you've done. Please be with us and apply these truths to us. In your good name, amen.